Hey everybody, Bill Kinney here doing my 126th problem solving video to help people study for actuarial exam 2 on financial math. It's been a long time since I've done these videos, back in January, four months ago here in 2018. It's now mid-May, late May actually, 2018. Been pretty busy in our spring semester here at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been making a lot of abstract algebra lecture videos. But I want to get back now with the semester being essentially over. We're actually in finals week, but I've got some time here today to get back into making financial math problem solving videos, ultimately some more lecture videos, maybe also some multivariable calculus and real analysis videos too, problem solving type of things. Uh, but my main priority is financial math because I teach a summer school class on that. Um, most of these videos we've done problems, as you know, from the sixth edition of the Mathematics of Investment and Credit by Samuel Broverman, sometimes also taking problems from the second edition of the Theory of Interest by Stephen Kellison. But in these four months since I've made one of these videos, I got something special in the mail. I got the seventh edition of the Mathematics of Investment and Credit by Samuel Broverman. And that's what we, we, we will now take problems from here in future problem solving videos. I was comparing the two books, the 6th and 7th editions. They're not really that much different from each other. Everything that we've done to this point will apply. I'm sure a lot of the problems would be pretty much the same, if not exactly the same. And in fact, this particular problem, 5.1.2, is exactly the same from the 6th and 7th editions. Um, so it's not really that much different. I did read some of the preface information. It sounds like most of the changes in the 7th edition are in the exposition, especially in the later chapters, chapters 6 and beyond. So it's not really affecting what we've done so far. You'll find use of this whether you have the 6th edition or the 7th edition. In this video we're going to be comparing net present values for four different cash flows, and in fact it's this main cash flow example we've been thinking about, an example from the book Smith and his line of credit. Uh, for a range of different interest preference rates, I did talk about interest preference rate in the last video. Actually in this problem statement, which we'll look at right now, don't be scared off by its length, hang with me here, they never mention the phrase interest preference rate, which um, the book also calls cost of capital. But I'll tell you that we can think of it that way, and it's in the reading for this section anyway, so I think it's worth mentioning as we go. Okay, so we again have Smith and his line of credit account. Maybe you want to imagine Smith over here as a stick figure. And the line of credit account, LOC over here, that's like the bank. Essentially, a line of credit is its kind of like a mixture of a savings account and a loan. Smith can deposit money into the line of credit, which makes the line of credit balance positive. However, as far as Smith's cash flow at that moment in time, that's a negative cash flow as far as Smith is concerned at that moment in time, even though it's good for his line of credit account. Or Smith can withdraw money. Uh, that's good for Smith at that moment thinking of it as being money going into his hands, a positive amount. Bad for his line of credit account, it's making the balance go down or even making it become negative, for example, meaning that he's really treating it as a loan and he will owe money back. So yeah, the balance on that account could be negative. He owes to the account, he has taken money out. Positive cash flows to himself make the balance, tend to make the balance negative. Or the balance can be positive, the account owes him. He has the cash flow as negative as far as Smith is concerned because he has deposited money in the account. It is good for his account, but negative to him as far as the cash flow at that moment in time. So it's the concepts here that are kind of challenging to get your mind around. And in fact, this is a very conceptual question. Not really too much to do here mathematically, So I, though I will do some math. It's really more understanding the idea of what's going on here. Balances either way, positive or negative, earn interest at a rate of I per period. Now in real life, it could be different interest rates depending on whether your balance is positive or negative. But here we assume it's the same, to keep it simple. Assume it's open at time zero, closed with a balance of zero at time two. He is clearing the outstanding balance at time two, making it zero. In what you see below here, which we've seen these numbers before, Got time one and time two, which are times one and two. Time zero is also time zero. You've got these A's, 
and B's, the A's are withdrawals from the line of credit, positive cash flow to Smith, though they tend to make the line of credit balance more negative or lower if it's positive, and the B's are payments to the line of credit, negative as far as cash flow from Smith's perspective at that moment in time, though again, it improves the balance on the line of credit. Thus, the payment B2, which is the only difference that you see in comparing A, B, C, and D here, um, clears the outstanding balance. So there's going to be different interest rates going on here since that last payment there of the Bs is different. You see down here now a given cash flow vector. So again, a very conceptual question here. It's also notationally confusing. We want to try to sift through these this notation and these concepts. Got a cash flow vector, n plus one numbers here, n plus one tuple starting with C0. In this case, uh, in the given case, n is two, which means we have three payments. In each, at each moment in time, i, ci is going to be ai minus bi net cash flow, which can be positive or negative. And for a general financial transaction where you have this cash flow vector, there will be a mix of positives and negatives. Sometimes maybe just one positive and the rest are negatives or vice versa. Or in general, there could be a mixture. Okay, so that's the net cash flow from Smith's perspective, AI minus BI. So in the given situation, C0 is going to be A0 minus B0. 0, zero minus 1 is negative 1. C1 is going to be A1 minus B1. 2.3 minus 0 is positive 2.3. And C2 is going to be 0 minus whatever B2 is. Negative B2 might be the best way to write that. For simplicity, I'm going to let B2 be represented by just the letter B. Okay, that's my notation. That's going to make something a little bit simpler later on. So B is going to be this amount that can change as we go from uh, scenario A through scenario D as B decreases. We've got a given interest rate, I. Now I could call this, as mentioned in the last video, an interest preference rate. Okay, and what is that? Again, you'll find it in the reading in Chapter 5. Um, think of it this way. You've got your, your a company, you're, maybe you're the owner of a small company, and you're thinking about making investment in capital. Okay, And interest rate, preference rates are sometimes called cost of capital. Maybe you want to buy some machines uh, to manufacture a product. Maybe you want to buy some software. Maybe you need to buy your employees' company vehicles. You've got investments to make. And you're wondering what kind of return are you going to get on those investments. Hopefully they increase profits, increase productivity, um, and you can quantify that. Now there is issues that they cost money and they also, some things like cars depreciate. Taking all those kinds of things into account, what kind of return are you going to get? And what what is that return compared to, say, the going rate on bonds, right? If you want to invest in corporate bonds, maybe the going rate uh, for the kinds of investments you want to make is 4% per year or something right now. So you kind of want to compare, okay, if I make these investments in capital for this given interest preference rate, 4% that I can get on bonds, is my net present value, my NPV, or maybe just PV for short, going to be negative, zero, or positive? Ideally, you'd want it to be positive, okay? Um, and ultimately, the goal of this problem is to compare the specific cash flows above, compare when i is bigger than negative 1, which is all the realistic possible kinds of situations. By the way, when i is between negative 1 and 0, you are losing money, essentially. You're going to have this sequence of inequalities being true. Where again, here's the formula for the NPV right here. And this is, well, it's using summation notation, so it might be a little confusing to you that way. But it's, it's something we've seen a lot of. Think about a timeline. We've got time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3, etc. Up through time n. 
where you have these net cash flows, these C's going on. You've got C0, C1, C2, C3, etc. Up through CN, N plus 1 cash flows. It's going to be a mixture of positives and negatives. The present value or net present value at the given value of I is the present value at time zero of this cash flow for that given interest rate I. C0 is already at time zero, so it does not get discounted. Notice that when k is zero here, you're going to get a v to the t zero, which is zero here as it is in most problems. v to the zero is one, so the first term is going to be just c zero. When t is one, c one needs to go back in time, be discounted by one unit of time. t one is one, so when k is one, you're going to get v to the first power here times c one. You're going to get a plus c one v. When you're at time two, the cash flow is C2. It's got to go back two periods of time. It's got to get multiplied by V to the T2. T2 is two. The next term is going to be C2V squared. Notice the subscript on the V. I'm not putting the subscript there. That's just to emphasize that V does depend on I, et cetera. The last term is going to be when K is N, you're going to get CN V to the N. Yes, V is VI is 1 over 1 plus i, or 1 plus i to the negative 1 power. So you can also write the summation like this with a 1 plus i in there and a negative tk power. tk in general doesn't have to be a whole number. In most examples like this one it is, but they allow for general t's there, and so that's why they don't just put k. They put a tk in general in this formula. All right, so that's the basic setup. Now the concepts get even a little bit harder, especially with the way this notation is written. When you look at this, you say to yourself, okay, well, is uh, I is given, I guess that's fixed, and C is a variable. Can I think of a vector as being a variable? The short answer is yes. What kind of variable? It's a variable where each of the um, components or coordinates can change independently. In the given example, it's only the C2, that's changing. C2 equals negative B2, which is I'm calling negative B here. It's these different values. Everything else is staying constant. So I could think of this as a function of C. Different Cs give me different present values. And I is fixed, meaning V is also fixed. But wait a minute. I want to show for any I greater than negative 1 that I got this kind of thing. In other words, these things depend on I too. Maybe that means, since I need to do this for any I, I need to think of i as a variable as well? And the answer is, yes, you can do that, and we will do that. And in fact, we're even going to think of it mostly as v being the variable. And again, there's this relationship between v and i. v is 1 plus i to the negative 1. That also means i is 1 over v minus 1. v to the negative 1 minus 1. So for any v or any i, I've got that relationship going on. I can think of it any way I want, but the notation just makes it extra confusing. Um, so it's not ideal, and I don't know that there is a most ideal notation, and different authors have different notations, and so it makes it extra confusing that way. But let's get our minds around the main basic concept here. And here's the key thing as far as finishing the problem goes. Um, let me write this down. This is worth writing down. We will think of these quantities, these net present values, these PICs, if you will. Bold vectors are bold faced when printed and often they have a little hat above them when you write them by hand. Although some people write the hat going the other way. This is actually a kind of a half arrow there. We'll think of those quantities as it'll be easiest to think of them as functions of V for different C's. And in this example, that means i.e. different B2's, which since I'm letting B equal B2, it'll be for different B's. B is going to be a parameter, you might say, for a family of functions of V, as functions of V for different C's, meaning different B's. 
And that's going to lead me to one more bit of notation. I'm going to call these functions f sub b of v. Okay, It's going to represent this quantity right here. Think of it that way. With the given c0, c1, and c2, c0 and c1 are fixed. B, c2 is negative b. That's the thing that makes this really what you might call a family of functions. Functions of v for different b's. Each value of b gives you a different function of v. And we can graph them all in the same graph with the v-axis horizontal. So the formula, uh, again, c0 is negative 1, look, looking right there. c1 is 2.3, then I get a plus 2.3 times v. Notice i got to multiply c1 times v. And then c2 is negative b. That gets multiplied by v squared. Now, as far as answering the question, explaining why for any i greater than negative 1, which, again, is equivalent to any v that's positive, typically, you know, when, when i is bigger than 0, v is less than a 1 as well. When i is negative, v is bigger than a 1. That's when you're losing money. Um, but we want to think about this being true for v positive, which is equivalent to i being greater than negative 1. So uh, to finish the problem, it's actually pretty easy. You can just say for any b, the first part of this function right there is the same, no matter what b2, which equals b, is. It's the last part that's different. And as we transition from CA to CB to CC to CD, meaning transition to scenario A to B to C to D, you can see these Bs, Bs decrease. So the coefficient here of V squared is decreasing, getting closer to zero, meaning we're subtracting something that's getting closer to zero which means the whole function is getting bigger for that given value of v. That's worth saying again, maybe even writing out. For any fixed v that's positive, um, so think of that as fixed, even though this is a function of v here. Uh, bv squared will decrease as b decreases. Which is what we have here. The b's are decreasing as we go from scenario a to scenario b to scenario c to scenario d. So minus bv squared will increase because of the minus sign as b decreases. And that essentially does it. Therefore, three dots means therefore, fbv increases as b decreases, which implies what we want, that these inequalities are true. Those p's up there are the same as fbv. They are getting bigger as b is decreasing as we go from scenario a to b to c to d. Okay, so that essentially does it. That solves the problem. Let me add a little bit more. Um, let me emphasize that you can if you're interested, think about graphs here. Um, graphs of this function of v for different b's. And you can use calculus to, for example, find the local max. If you differentiate this with respect to v, and we will make a graph here as functions of v, you're going to get 2.3. A negative 1 differentiates to 0, 2.3v differentiates to 2.3, minus bv squared differentiates to 2bv. If we're after the local max, which is really a global max, we can set this equal to 0, 
and solve for v, what we'll get is v equals, let's see, bring add 2bv to both sides, divide both sides by 2b, we'll get 2.3 over 2b, which is the same as 1.15 over b. So the first coordinate, excuse me here while I log in, the first coordinate of the maximum point will be 1.15 over b. What's the second coordinate? Plug that critical point into the original function. Find f sub b of the critical point, replace v with 1.15 over b, we'll get negative 1 plus 2.3 times 1.15 over b, minus b times 1.15 squared over b squared. One of those b's will cancel. Uh, get a common denominator of b. We'll get negative b plus 2.3 times 1.15 is 2.645 minus 1.15 squared, 1.15 squared is 1.3225 over b, uh, 2.645 minus 1.3225 is 1.3225, <clears throat> excuse me. This is going to tell us something kind of neat here, so hang with me here. So that's the second coordinate of the maximum point. And so we can draw a generic graph in this situation of f, b, v as a function of v, which is, again, the present value as well, net present value. Um, its vertical intercept is negative 1. It's got an initial slope at time at v equals 0 of 2.3. That's the slope no matter what v is. It's the concavity that changes. And as b, t, b decreases, as we go down this list, the graph is going to increase. It's going to go up. So for a given um, high value of b, the graph might be like this. As b goes down, the graph actually goes up until you get an intercept and maybe a couple intercepts, etc. This is the kind of thing it's going to look like. Is it going to be a strict vertical translation? Actually, no. Uh, the first coordinate here, as b decreases, this is going to increase. So the critical point is going to move to the right as b decreases. And this thing is going to go up. It's going to go higher as b decreases. So the point, the critical point is moving upward and to the right as b decreases. Um, you can check that out, that this does increase here. And in fact, the interesting thing to look at here is you can see that it, the um, second coordinate of the critical point is going to be 0 when b is 1.3225. That's where you get what you might call a bifurcation, in a sense, from no critical points to one critical point when you have at that value of b to more than one. And that, to end the video, is corresponding back up here to when you got um, IRRs, internal rate of returns, that were complex in the first case then real, and more than one of them in these cases. The situation where you'd have one unique internal rate of return is when b is 1.3225. That's going to be this graph right here. So that can help you understand the bigger picture here, and that was why that was worth talking about. I hope you enjoyed the video.